I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Rosie Waterland is an author, columnist, screenwriter and comedian. Rosie's first big break came with her satirical recaps of The Bachelor. Receiving seven million unique clicks, they were described as the best television writing since Clive James. Her books, podcasts and comedy shows all have received rave reviews and dramatic commercial success. So your, your writing is... Uh, it's just a joy, it's a sensation. I, I've written down something, I, in case, oh, don't embarrass her. But you, you said, uh, it, it, I forget which one it was in, but it was, um, someone was disappointed, and you just wrote the phrase, like a kid seeing Santa leaving a shopping centre in his Toyota Corolla. <laughs> and, and I go, oh, I'm quite funny. <laughs> well, 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 no, but so, so you look at that and you go, you, you can't write that sentence uh, unless you have a talent. Oh, thank no, no, you. it's good. You go. That's that's. I forgot what? I'd even written that. Well, no, isn't that great? And, 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 and it, 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 it's like a random thing in one of your many, yeah. many, many things. But you go, God, that's a, such a such a cute turn of phrase. Oh, thank you so much. No, no. So having, oh, I've read so much about you. Bloody hell! Um, having read so much about you, I have to ask: Are, are you all right? How are you doing? <laughs> Well, no, because you, you look lovely and fine, but, but you go, fuck, I, I wonder if I give you a hug all the time. Yeah. Is, is, are you all right? Are you, are you, how are you feeling? Uh, yeah, I'm good. I mean, it's been a particularly weird few years just because I think so much of my creative output has been centred around the difficult and traumatic things that happened to me. And, you know, I wrote a book about my difficult childhood, then toured a show about it. Then I wrote a book about the death of my best friend and toured show about it. Then I did a podcast based on the first book in which I let my mum come in and dispute everything I had written, which actually ended up... Such a great podcast. It is, but it was quite traumatic for me to go through recording that um, because, you know, there's a lot of power that comes from finally defining your narrative and saying these awful things happened to me and then letting the person who essentially was the cause of those awful things come in and say, no, they didn't. Mm. Um, It was very difficult for me to record and I didn't quite realise how much it was affecting me until I sort of got to the end of the podcast and, and it started coming out on air and it became very popular and everyone kept saying how much they loved my mum and how they thought my mum was hilarious and they all started calling her Mama Lisa and saying she was the hero of the podcast and of my story and um, I just kind of had a bit of a breakdown from that, I think, and... Um, I ended up having some time in psychiatric care last year and I didn't quite understand why I'd gone backwards because I'd been dealing with PTSD for most of my 20s and got to this point where I was handling it quite well. And it wasn't until I really broke it down with my psychiatrist that he said, you know, you've essentially just been reliving your trauma for the last four years and you need to stop doing that now, Rosie. (laughs) So we, we had um, Osher on this program, yeah, uh, and he was talking quite movingly about um, writing his book. Mm. You go, well, bloody hell! I, I mean, I've I've got to 
write that chapter about that thing, but I, I mean, I sort of rather not. Well, yeah, yeah particularly <laughs> when you when you suffer from PTSD as as I do and have, um, a huge part of learning to manage that is uh, figuring out uh, what memories are triggering for you and figuring out ways to get through life without letting those memories become too intrusive. Um, and writing my first book, especially, was all about embracing all of those memories and actually having to sit down and document them in detail, you know, while adding in jokes about Santa and the Corolla to make it not too insufferably awful. Well, you've you really got me you got me nervous now because we're going to go through five <laughs> items and I hope none of them are yeah. hideous trigger points. No, uh, not really. <laughs> I mean, look, it's fine. I think it's, um, I think I just got a bit cocky because my career was going so well that I wasn't keeping check of how it was affecting me mentally. And the last year is when I've sort of taken stock and and realised that I need to be, uh, I need to have more of a duty of care to myself when I'm doing that kind of stuff. Good on you. There's a quote from John Cleese where uh, someone came up to him, the the famous English comedian, and and said, you know, you're not funny anymore. I liked you in, you know, 40 Towers or Monty Python. Yeah. Uh, And he said, so you would prefer that I am mentally unwell so I can do a half hour TV program to make you giggle yeah. after your dinner. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I'm sorry, but, but I'm, no. I've never been happier. I, I, and if you don't like my latest film, Fiscal yeah. One or whatever else, then I'll live with that. But I'm quite happy. Yeah. Anyway, so your film, we've got to get onto your five. <laughs> okay. okay. I was so, embarrassed about this Well, one. so you bloody should be. The <laughs> sequel to Grease. I mean, woman, <laughs> what are you talking about? 33% on Rotten Tomatoes, the worst film ever made, Grease 2. Yeah. Tell me about it. Uh, first of all, I dispute that it's the worst film ever made. <laughs> one of. Um, <laughs> and second of all, I think 33% is a crushingly low score for what is a piece of cinematic brilliance. I'm surprised it got in double figures. Listen, (laughs) it is a great, great film. I will always maintain that it's better than the first Grease. I love the first Grease, but Grease 2 is better. It has better soundtrack. It has Michelle Pfeiffer. The gender roles are flipped, so Michelle Pfeiffer's the cool one and the dorky one is uh, the lead, played by Maxwell Caulfield. Um, And... To be honest, I loved it just because it was that movie that every kid has a movie that they could play 200 times and never, ever get sick of it. And Grease 2 was mine. I just loved it. And I used to act out all the parts. I knew all the songs. I knew all the dances. I had this wonderful little friend um, called Stuart um, who loved doing all the parts as well. And... It's really the movie that made me want to perform and act and be on stage. And I think it's probably the reason I ended up going to drama school, to be honest. This, this, is, this is amazing. And, and, and amongst a whole bunch of other films that you would have been seeing at the same time, yeah. you, you that one just touched you. Yeah. So, you, you know, it made Pfeiffer's career, but it destroyed Caulfield. Did you know yes, that? Yes, I did know Isn't that. that uh, you go, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also what a lot of people don't know is an v- incredibly talented actress um, and writer called Pamela Adlon has a very small role in it as like the geeky little sister of one of the pink ladies and she went on to of course become like uh, Louis C.K.'s main kind of partner in writing um, his brilliant show even though she's now kind of disconnected from him because it turns out he's a creep. But she's doing all her own stuff now and she's this brilliantly celebrated both, you know, critically and um, commercially woman and she started off in that wow. film too. So there but, you go. Now you mentioned Louis C.K. And, and, and I read it, might, this might be out of date, that, that he's one of your faves. Is that, is that right? Oh, he was. But you can't get over the wanking thing. No, I can't. No. no. I understand that. I, you know what? I can't get over the wanking thing. I also can't get over that he seems completely unapologetic about it and has gone since gone on this stand-up tour where he's basically making f- like making light of the fact that it happened and bitching about the fact that it's ruined his career. I don't think he really realises the seriousness of the 
way he abused and assaulted and took advantage of these women, and that's what upsets me. I mean, there's another comedian called Aziz Ansari who was in his own kind of controversy where uh, he went on a date with a woman who then uh, did an interview saying she felt like he had forced her... And there was a lot of debate about that because people were fighting about whether it was just a bad date or whether it was assault or whatever it was. Um, And he has recently started doing a stand-up tour again where he's actually talking about it and saying, I didn't realise that I had made her uncomfortable. You know, I've I have been raised in this way where you're taught to just keep pursuing if the woman says no, which is what every romantic comedy Uh, teaches, guys. And what she said in that that case, which is really nuanced case, is, and this is her talking, is I was giving him non-verbal signals. Signals, yes. And and, 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 And he didn't read them. And and it's it's easy, if you're not part of it, to go, Mm. well, how about a verbal one? Yeah, but it's not that easy. But it's it's not that easy. It's really, as a woman, it's not that easy. And so he's finally started saying in his routine, like, he actually said, one of my friends came to me, one of his male friends came to him and said, you know, it's made me think back on dates I went on and about whether I had ever made women feel that uncomfortable. And he said, so if I have friends coming to me telling me that it's making them rethink their behaviour and I'm rethinking my behaviour, then hopefully then that's the good that can so, come from this. Yeah. And so I think he's had a much more nuanced, better reaction. <laughs> And how we got to Greece too to that <laughs> discussion ah, well, is that's interesting. That's the joy of this that's format. That's the joy of it, the, Nigel. The five of my life. So we're going to go to your second choice. Okay. So you've gone from a fluffy feel-good fiction film yes. to a graphic no holds barred <laughs> reality. A baby is born. Yes. Tell me about it, you nutter. <laughs> okay, so this is the book choice of mine. Um, and it is a book that I think my mum was very scared to have honest, uh, open communications about sex and our bodies with us when we were younger. So when we were teenagers, she left this book out called Every Girl for my sister and I to look in. That was just all about your period and your changing body and stuff. But when we were little, she left out this book when she was pregnant with my younger sister, Taylor. She left out this book called A Baby is Born. And it's like an information book for parents. But it was filled with graphic colour photographs of, you know, babies' heads halfway out the vag and women's faces contorted in pain and and things like that area of skin getting cut with the scalpel between the, the vag and the and the poop hole. And I, <laughs> I, I can't even believe, I feel like I'm probably the only one ever who's going to say these words on your podcast, but it gave me nightmares about childbirth. It also, I think, looking back, is what planted the seeds of me becoming a feminist because ever since then I've said I either don't want to have children. I used to say that when I was young. But because of the the, the pain of getting... Because of the pain of going through that. Or then when I got older and realised it was an option and actually the first article I ever wrote that went viral and got me a bit of attention was about if I ever have kids, I'm going to have an elective C-section. Because to me, I don't understand why women are forced to go through this pain for a medical procedure when we live in an age of modern medicine. I mean, you wouldn't expect a man to get one of his balls chopped off without any anaesthetic and say, well, that's just part of being a man. Hmm. That's what we say to these women. You have to push it out. You have to go through 18 hours of the worst pain in your entire life and it's just part of being a woman. It's just womanhood. And I just think, to me, that's an incredible sign of inequality. I feel like women's medical problems aren't taken seriously. I feel like there's a reason endometriosis has only just become a medical condition that the medical community seems to be taking seriously because women always just got told it was like, oh, it's just period pain. It's just a woman. It's just woman's troubles. And so, you know, that book always made me mad and terrified me and upset me. And I used to think, why don't men have to go through this? And so, yes, it terrified me as a kid, but in hindsight, I'm a feminist now. And I think that's probably why. I think it started with that. What an amazing impact. It's so <laughs> and, 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 and where, if you don't mind me asking, where, where have you landed, not, not the procedure itself, mm. but where have you landed with the, the concept of children? 
Um, you know, I'm 32 now, so I'm sort of at an age where I'm thinking, shit, like, I've seriously got to think about it. Is, is that, I, mean, I, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm, I'm an ignorant yeah. bloke, is, is when, when does that, those thoughts start? I would have thought 32 is a bit, is a bit early, isn't it? No, to, I mean, not, okay. from the age of 35 is when your eggs dramatically decrease okay. and then between 35 and 40 by the time you're 40 you pretty much have a very low chance of having right. children okay so you know i'm 32 um I, I, I have a boyfriend but i'm not i have career aspirations still like it's not something i can really see myself doing for another four or five years and so i don't know like I've had an abortion before I've written about. I've, well, I've had two abortions before that I've written openly about when I was younger. Is that wonderful new anthology that's being... Yes, yeah, 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 I've contributed those uh, that essay to that um, anthology coming out called Choice Words, which is about women and abortion. Um, but I'm now at, at the point where, and this is how I explain it to people, if I got pregnant now, it wouldn't be an immediate, no thanks. Right. I'd have to think think about it. But also, in answer to the question you didn't ask, it would absolutely be with an elective C-section. I can't imagine why you would do it any other way. The song that you chose is mm. Bitter Sweet Symphony by yes. The Verve. Fabulous song, fabulous video. Mm. Tell me why. To be honest, I don't remember the video. Isn't it just black and white and they're, they're walking? Is that yeah, what it so is? Richard Ascroft, the, the, the lead singer yes. and songwriter, is walking down a street in London, a, a suburb I used to live in, yeah. um, but he's not deviating. So what's happening? Oh, I reckon. You, so what's happening? So he's it. bumping into people. Yeah, where yeah, In normal yeah. life, you'd say, "Oh, I'm awfully sorry, excuse me," but he's not in, like he hasn't noticed. Also, oh, just like any man. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it's, it's quite it's quite sort of violent. He, yeah, he's just right. walking down, singing the song, and then and you think, "Oh, are you going to hit that old lady?" Bang! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 mowing a path through well, humanity. See, I don't really remember the video because. Um, I picked this song, I wouldn't say it's a favourite, but it's notable in my life. And it's the first thing I thought of when I got sent your list of requests because it's the song my mum used to listen to, who my mum was and is an alcoholic, um, when she used to get drunk and have, like, her sad drunk afternoons. So if you'd get home from school and her bedroom door would be shut and bittersweet symphony would just be blasting through the walls you're like oh mum's drunk don't go in there and that was like her sad self-pitying song it was that and then also the drugs don't work right. were her two that she would listen to and it got to the point where my sister went into her bedroom and took the CD out of the CD player and snapped it in half because we just could not <laughs> listen to it <laughs> anymore but it kind of just became I wouldn't say it's a sad memory it's more just funny and whenever I hear that song I'll message my older sister and say guess what song just came on the radio and she'll immediately message back bittersweet symphony <laughs> like we just both <laughs> remember it as the warning sign not to go in there so did, did your mum still drink she does. She stopped drinking for a while. She stopped for about two years, which is when we recorded the podcast, which in hindsight, I was smart because I knew she's not going to be sober for long. So if, if I'm ever going to get any record of her saying anything about her memories of our life, it needs to be now. Um, yeah, and she started drinking again. So, yes. so, so, which I always suspected she would. Um, not everybody else did because it was the first time anybody had ever really heard her, you know, speak publicly. And she's very charming and very funny, and people love her. And because she was sober, and it was the first time anybody had heard that she'd been sober. They, people assume that once you're sober, you're sober forever. Mm. What I didn't have the heart to tell people is, oh, no, she's done this about a 100 times and she will start drinking again, which I knew the whole time we were recording the podcast. I actually had, you know, a, a lot of serious chats with Podcast One higher up saying this could 
go wrong at any time. Yeah, like she could start drinking at any time, so I can't guarantee you that will even finish. But, yeah, she was sober for about two years, which, to be honest, is the longest she's ever been sober. Did she do AA or did she do it on her own or what she... This time she did it on her own. She um, went into liver failure when she was living in the Northern Territory with her partner um, because he's a nurse and you get nursing contracts up there. And um, she was in hospital for six weeks and they basically said to her, you know, you're going to die. You need to stop drinking or you will die. And for whatever reason, that snapped something in her brain and she stopped drinking for two years. Um, But, yeah, she's drinking again now. But it's not, it's not, surprising. It's disappointing, but it's not hugely upsetting to my sisters and I because we always expected it. So I, I mean, it's a subject close to my heart because yeah. I haven't had a drink for 16 years Yeah. now. Uh, um, in in all your uh, challenges that you write about, yeah. where have you landed with the, the drink and the drugs? Oh, I mean, look, I've I you I have used alcohol to self medicate I think surely in the past but it's never been a, an addiction problem for me I wouldn't say and not really to any of my sisters um I drink like casually now with friends but and I certainly went through that phase in my early 20s where I like went out a lot and you know which I think most people do um but I certainly recognized that at particular, particularly difficult or anxious times in my life, I would use alcohol to help with that. Um, but it was always kind of isolated to those incidences. So I, and then, yeah, I'm not sure, like I'd say it's been problematic in the past, but not to the point where I've ever felt like my mother. Do you know what I mean? Like, I suppose because to me, I've seen, to me, both my parents were alcoholics and they just drank all day, every day. And so I always considered, oh, well, as long as I'm not drinking that much, then I'm not an alcoholic. I'm fine. Um, So it took me a while to go, Rosie, maybe when you feel anxious, you shouldn't be having half a bottle of wine. You should be going to the gym or something, you know, which is something I've realized the last few years. And, but I also think, Most people kind of realise that when they get into their 30s, isn't it? Just a sort of healthy life, rite of passage. I don't know. It's just boring growing up stuff. Yeah, exactly. Excessive drinking. You know, why not? Why not? But but, but but there are are two groups of people, and my my missus would most definitely fit into the first, who you... Even if you excessively drank, you wouldn't actually have a problem. It's about your relationship with it. Yeah. And then there's other people, unfortunately, which I, I fit within, and it sounds like your mum might, where you go, you could even drink less than those other people, but you've still got a problem. Yeah. It's a very complex... Um, like, I've never felt like I need to drink. Right. Um, and I, neither, neither have any of my sisters, which... Um, and, you know, I know of people in my life who do have... You, you, you know the you know the film Train Spotting. Yes, the wonderful I mean, say wonderful it's revolting, but the wonderful scene in it when Ewan McGregor goes down the public loo yeah. to get the yeah, and you go that for me that's a very effective thing, affecting scene because you go that's that's the desperation yeah you, you, you go I don't care if, if if I have to swim through a river of shit to get the next you know hit of smack or whatever else yeah. then, then fair enough well that's a good way of putting it Nigel see I like a drink but I wouldn't swim through a river of shit to get it there you go <laughs> and on that note <laughs> now, now for your um, fourth choice uh, the place you have chosen the Blue Mountains yeah. now, that, now that's quite um, that's quite a large place I know so can when, you get more specific well or is yeah because when I listened to some other episodes people chose specific addresses yes, and yeah. I'd already sent in my choices so I thought uh oh when Elaine Beachley chose the ocean well, yeah, which, is, which is bigger than the Blue Mountains um, well yeah I suppose I can give you an address Queens Road Lawson what happened there that was our house. Right. Um, so my mum, my sisters and I got out of foster care and while we were in foster care, she had met a man um, who she started dating and he had inherited a house, which was that house in the Blue Mountains. And so we got out of foster care and immediately moved up to this just very foreign place to us because we'd always grown up sort of in and around Sydney and... Um, 
and we were with this man and in a house that we owned, which we had gone from like housing commission and places, you know, called the ghetto, nicknamed the ghetto. Um, And then we went up to this beautiful house just in this beautiful kind of bushy area that was at this perfect place sort of halfway up the mountain that on a clear day you could actually see the city. Like that's how beautiful the view was from this place. I'm sure the house is worth like a shitload of money now. And so we lived in that house on and off for four years, which is why I picked it Uh, or the Blue Mountains as a place, because even though with my mum's drinking, we would get sent away and come back and sent away and come back, that was still our base for four years, which is the longest at that point we had ever lived in one place. It was the longest I ever went to one school. Like I went to more than 20 schools and the only high school friends I still have today are the friends from that four-year period of time. Have you ever been back to the house? Uh, Yeah, my sister and I drove past it. We took her kids um, and went on a road trip up to Katoomba one day, which is weird because when you live in the Blue Mountains, it's not a tourist destination to you. Like after school, we used to just hang out at the Coles near Katoomba Station and, you know, you'd go get a pie in Lura and we used to shoplift at that famous lolly shop like (laughs) because, we, you know, we just lived there. Um, But we took the kids up there and so we took them to the Three Sisters and stuff and then on the way back we stopped in at the house and um, it's different now because the area has become very developed. So it used to be about one house every few hundred metres just and bush in between and now it just kind of looks like one of those home villages. Like it's completely full in a way that it wasn't back then. Um, But the house itself is still the same and I've always said one day if one of my books takes off and I become a bazillionaire, that's the first house I would want to buy. And would you to buy to live in or to or to demolish? No, to live in. Right, okay. I loved it. I mean, there's some traumatic memories there because with my childhood, for every good memory, there's like five bad ones. But it's the only place I ever lived long enough as a kid to have some sense of home, f- home or familiarity. And I never had that anywhere else. And I haven't really had it until now that I've been old enough to support myself and I've lived in one house for like five years now um, that I rent. But like, that's why one of my biggest dreams is just to buy a house or it's Sydney. So maybe a very small apartment. I just want to buy a place that I never have to move out of ever. So we are living parallel lives because every place I've ever lived in, I'm I'm a military kid. So we moved around every three years. Um, And every place I've ever lived in, I've said to my wife, this is it. Yeah. Right. And, and, and currently I'd say that. You go, I, I'd be happy <laughs> yeah. to be moved out of my house in a box. I've got no desire, no aspirations, nothing. Mm. It's, it's lovely. It's perfect. And one of the things in the house is, you know, those height charts for yeah. the kiddies, right? So we've been there 12 years uh, and, and my kids, you know, my youngest ones are 18. So it's got all the kids and all oh. their friends. So if, I mean, and I mean this seriously, Rosie, is if I had to move, which I'm never going to, mm. I would take that bit of the wall with me. Yeah. I, I would ask somebody, what do you do? Do you scan it? Do you, or can I actually rip it out of the house or whatever? You go, it, it, it's so important yeah. to me. You go, it represents everyone I love yeah. on, on the wall. And you've been in this one place. Yeah. I'll never move, Nigel. And, well, I don't, I don't want to. That's the dream. <laughs> I would stay in one place forever if I could. And I think that's why I never had a huge interest in travelling either. I haven't really done that. I've traveled a little bit for work, but other than that, I've never been hugely invested. I've always thought I would rather spend my money in just living in one place right. <laughs> than having to go other. I don't I just want to live in one place and just Be happy. sit on the couch and not have any drama. Yeah. Peace of mind. Yeah. Watch some TV, have a healthy glass of wine, just the one. And maybe and stroke the hair of your blue haired <laughs> <laughs> Troll doll. Now, there's a link for you, which is your fifth choice. Your possession, possession. is the blue-haired troll doll. Mm. If I get this right, your dad stole for you. Oh, yeah. Tell my, me the story. Oh, my dad was a big shoplifter because he was a total nutter. So, I mean, like I said before, he was an alcoholic, so he was always drunk. Um, he also had schizophrenia, so he was just a bit off. Um, which we didn't know at the time. So we just thought he was a bit weird and we didn't find out till after he died, actually, that he'd had schizophrenia. But um, he used to steal 
strange things and things that he didn't even really need to steal. And the problem is because he was drunk, he thought he was really stealth and like sneaky and skilled at it. But it was so obvious that he was stealing. Like the amount of times we got kicked out of Macquarie Shopping Centre. And I think he sort of became quite prolific to the guards and they felt quite sorry for like my sister and I, like they just sort of, they stopped calling the police. They'd just come over and go, Tony, not today. Come on. We don't have time. Put it back on the shelf take you girls home. So it just kind of got to that point. But there was this um, troll doll, which was super popular when I was a kid. And then this special edition troll doll came out called a treasure troll doll. And it was a treasure troll doll because it had a jewel where its belly button should be. Right. And I wanted one so bad because I saw it in all the ads during Agro's Cartoon Connection in the morning. And my dad and I were at Macquarie Shopping Centre once and he told me to wait on a bench and he walked into the toy store and he came out with it and we quickly left. I knew that he'd stolen it, but I really wanted it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I've always kept it um, because I have kept all my childhood stuff. I have a few boxes filled with things like, you know, my kindergarten report card and uh, school uniform, my school uniform that was signed when I was in year six and everyone graduates and signs each other's shirts and and special toys like that. And after my dad died, we were allowed to take, my sister and I were each allowed to pick something off his desk. So I picked something and I've always kept that. And I have these three boxes of things that I've taken with me everywhere I've lived since I was a kid because my sister and I realized at one point, my older sister and I, if we don't keep this stuff no one else will. So my sister has a whole bunch of baby photos of all of us and I have all this sort of precious stuff and that's just one of the little toys that I always kept and it's, always remembered. It's so remembered. lovely hearing you, hearing you talk. You, you um, have a sort of a bottomless capacity to, to sort of forgive and get over, you know, reading about you and your story. I, I find it amazing that you are sort of not estranged from, you know, I'm sure she's lovely, um, but mm. not estranged from your mum and all that stuff. You, you just, it, you're an inspiration because you, cause <laughs> it, it's not, well, yeah, it's, it's not the best start in life. Um, yeah. And, uh, I, just, I just find it, uh, it it's a real honour to listen to you. And, and Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, my sister and I, my older sister and I have always said, you know, we can't help what happened to us. And with me in particular, it, it's had mental health effects, which I can't help the mental health effects it's had, but we can help how we move forward. And particularly with my older sister, Rhiannon, um, you know, who has three kids already and two more on the way, we were always very determined with her kids to say the trauma stops with us. I mean, intergenerational trauma is a huge part of why I think my parents had the problems that they had. And so we've always said, well, we have the capacity now to have that stop here and not move on to the next generation. And Rhiannon's kids are so amazing. So I feel like, I mean, she mostly did that. I just give them too much sugar and take them to the movies. But I feel like we've done a good job that, that, that's, stopping that's it there. That's such a wonderful insight and an actionable thing that you can do. I, I, I listened to a oh, awfully upsetting uh, podcast about... Um, uh, abuse in the, in in institutions mm. and, and the proportion who had themselves been abused yeah. is, it's it's just shocking and you go you, you know you can't change the past but if you, what what a gift what a gift if if or, you know all your family's kids and your kids you know don't have the experiences that you had hope so uh, so for the last question mm-hmm. um, who would you like to hear on five of my life next I thought about this and I couldn't decide between two amazing female writers, comedians, actors. The first one is Nakia Louie, who is um, an incredible Aboriginal Australian, probably most known for her playwriting. Um, But she's also done an amazing, hilarious show on the ABC called Kiki and Kitty. She has her own podcast with Miranda Tapsell called um, Pretty for an Aboriginal. Um, She's just so smart and so funny. And um, I would just love to hear what she has to say in any context. Wow, she sounds fabulous. So that's that's a high bar. Who's the next person? Um, The other one, I mean, is, I guess, of the same calibre, 
Celia Pacola, I just, she's hilarious. She um, writes uh, and acts in Rosehaven. She's a brilliant comedian. Everything she says is hilarious um, and smart and clever. And so, yeah, I mean, my answers are always just going to be smart, clever, interesting women. And those are two that I couldn't pick between. We will attempt to get both of them in. Okay. Now, now Rosie, uh, it's been a, a delight. So part of the... Uh, reason for me to do this is mm. I get to meet lovely people who I wouldn't normally meet. Yeah. And, and this has been a, a real highlight for me. Oh, and I wish you, you love and success in your future and I'm sure you're going to have lots of it. Oh, thank you so much. It's been lovely. Thank you. The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 